It's really a great pleasure to uh, introduce this year's Coleman Lecturer. As you know, this was established uh, back in 1993 by Stanley Chang. And this year, it's a particular pressure to introduce Dan Reinstein, who worked with us for many years and is still working with us on several projects. Um, you can see all of his titles. He accumulates them, so we have to make his name smaller each year because we have to get in all of the uh, things he's doing. He's an associate professor. Uh, he will be uh, an adjunct professor up at Columbia. He's an assistant professor here, but he's a uh, consulting ophthalmologist uh, uh, at uh, Guys at St. Thomas Hospital, King's College, London, and his real job is uh, heading up the London Vision Clinic, which he has made world famous. Uh, these are some previous lectures. You can see that's a <coughs> distinguished group of people that we've uh, uh, been honored <coughs> to add uh, uh, Dan to, uh, including uh, Don Gass and Dick Green and uh, Stanley Chang and, uh, and many others. Uh, you'll notice that Dan has changed his uh, uh, attire a bit since living in London. This is an earlier picture with a somewhat more avant-garde tie. <laughs> but many of you who are here know that Dan is an accomplished uh, saxophone player. And uh, he plays uh, evenings uh, most places he goes. and. Uh, accumulates a lot of new friends and helps them understand uh, ophthalmology as well. He just pointed out that it's uh, being able to see sharp and hit it, both, that are important to him. Uh, here are just some of his uh, uh, degrees. Uh, I won't go through all of them. I think the important thing is down under postgraduate. Uh, where he was a fellow in ophthalmology at Cornell between 91 and 94, and uh, was a visiting fellow from 94 to 96. Then he did his residency at Mount Sinai, worked up in Vancouver uh, with LASIK surgery and continued some of the work that he began here with Ron and Harriet and Mark and, uh, and me. Uh, just a few of the high points of his life, uh, nine patents, 70 peer-reviewed publications, 20 books and book chapters, numerous best paper and session awards from the ISRS, ASCRS, and the AAO, and he just told me that for the fourth year in a row uh, at the ASCRS, which just ended, he got what? Uh, best paper for presbyopia treatment. Best paper for presbyopia treatment. He's trying to uh, corner anybody over the age of 40 to have this done, and he's been working on me for too many years, not with the makeover. Anyway, um, he was with us in the very beginning when the Dyson Institute was, uh, was formed. Uh, those of you who didn't see Margaret Dyson and uh, before she died, this is uh, her appearance. This is a couple of earlier pictures with Mark and Dan and uh, Ron and I. And up in the top there is a picture of Fred Litzy, who was the engineer down at Riverside Research Institute, who worked with Ron in developing most of the digital uh, analytical techniques we have, Mark, as, as well, uh, in a relaxed position. The reason I like this photograph is that nowadays you see Dan with a cell phone in his ear. This was an older picture when he had to actually be connected with a cord, and uh, so it's a classic. This was the very, very first uh, ARC scan uh, that was done on a human, uh, and, and that's uh, Ron. And Dan, at that time, we had to mount this uh, on the floor, and that's Dan being the very first human subject. So those residents who are here who've been asked to volunteer for the Viagra studies and others, you're not the first to have to volunteer. Uh, this is uh, more recent. That is Stuart Cumming on the right, and Stuart to develop the crystal ends, uh, and Dan uh, and I looking at the, one of the very first Artemis units developed up in Vancouver, largely under Dan's direction. Anyway, um, it's a really a great pleasure for all of us, Dan, that you're going to be here to give the lecture today. Your accomplishments have been stellar. I think he's probably the best known uh, 
ophthalmologist in the world for LASIK and LASIK corrections, uh, which he does at the London Clinic, and uh, he takes care of some of the most difficult uh, errors or complications uh, in the world, and he gets patients referred from all over. So, Dan, looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, very, uh, flattering uh, introduction. Um, you know, I mean, I'll echo on the same note that uh, you know <coughs> this is giving the Coleman lecture is a it's my first name lecture, um, and uh, although I, I had a little in on uh, I guess on, on, on the action as to being invited, but but it's very significant for me uh, because of course I, I began my ophthalmic career by uh, leaving England after my uh, undergraduate training and came here to do research in Jack, Jack's lab uh, with Ron and Mark. And we were just reminiscing with Mark. We were walking around the park this afternoon about my first day when I, I walked in and met these two characters. And they took me to lunch. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, it, it, it is, it is a, a great honor to be invited back here uh, in this way uh, to share with you uh, some of the things that I've managed to um, achieve thanks to um, my association with uh, Jack and Ron and Mark, Harriet, uh, Tanya, who's not here, and uh, all the people who have formed a very, 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 this is a short list of extremely important people to me uh, in my life, and uh, Robert Fisher is sitting back there, and Oscar Velaz, and uh, of course I didn't mention my wife, who is uh, currently looking after our three children uh, uh, just next door. So, uh, My financial disclosure is that, of course, I, I <clears throat> having done all this work, we uh, have a financial interest in the Artemis technology, and uh, those are patents uh, which are owned by Cornell, as well as some new ones, and uh, we all ended up with a little tiny piece of the company as well, so maybe one day something will come out of it. However, um, we really did it for one reason, and we did it because it just so happened that refractive surgery for a good 15 years had only been performed uh, by trial and error. And if you think to the arcade days, it was really a question of doing something and then measuring and seeing where you were and then doing some more. It was an iterative process. And the idea of actually measuring within the cornea uh, was not even born. When I came to Cornell and I was a research fellow uh, at the beginning, and, and one of the great things about a great professor is someone who kind of just lets you float around to try and find your own way. And I got to say, for the first six months, I think they really didn't know what they'd taken on because I didn't do anything. I spent the whole time reading and going down to the library and photocopying papers on <clears throat> magnetism and the wound healing from Russia and all kinds of things. And one day, I measured. Um, a little globe of a little rabbit um, in Formland, and I was stayed late one night, and I'd already gone home, and I was scanning this little globe with this machine. And you see there's a oh, high-frequency ultrasound transducer here, which was attached to the prototype scanner that Jack and, and Ron and Mark had developed over the previous years to do digital ultrasound, to digitize the ultrasound, analyze the, 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 the actual waveform in the frequency domain and get spectral information from it, which they were doing to, as a, to improve diagnosis in melanoma. And um, really, it's still to this day probably the most accurate way of determining mortality or lethality of a melanoma is by tissue characterization parameters. And this is, of course, non-invasive. Anyhow, we put this high-frequency ultrasound transducer on which you could buy off the shelf from Panametrics. They make them for the uh, aviation and m metallurgic industry to find. Uh, mm. uh, these are standard off-the-shelf components. So we'd stuck it on here. And anyway, I was scanning this eye. And um, we scanned. Uh, this isn't actually the rabbit, but this is the sort of thing that we were observing. We were observing a, a three millimeter wide uh, front and back of the cornea. And we saw this second line here. And I hadn't done my ophthalmology residency yet, and uh, Ron and I kind of looked this up and realized that that must be the front and back of the epithelium we're looking at there. So we used one of the old Fortran-based DOS programs that Ron had called the 
DAS, the deconvolved analytic signal magnitude, to see if we could measure the thickness of that layer. And it was another program called the KEP strip. And this means that you can go sub-wavelength and make measurements within, within an, an echo complex. And it turned out we could measure this layer with about one micron precision. And I called um, one of the cornea guys in from the clinical part of the floor <coughs> up, up on the, um, in the Annenberg. And, um, and I said, geez, you know, do, do you think um, there's any potential uh, for being able to measure the epithelium in the cornea? And he said, no. <laughs> and I instantly knew that after six months, I would found exactly what it was that I was going to be doing for the rest of my career. Because when I looked in the literature, I found no references on in vivo measurements of the epithelium other than one by Brian Holden that was published in 81, 10 years before. And it was an optical, greatly magnified optical system to measure the epithelial thickness. There was no information on this. There was no data at all, 0.0, .0 which is unusual for anatomy in 1991. And so the first thing that happened was the word started spreading. And um, Norma, who was a fellow, came about six months after me. She, her boyfriend was down in, um, in, uh, at Johns Hopkins with Walter Stark. And they were getting, they were doing a bit of PTK action, which is, you know, step one for the extramer laser in the United States. He was husband, though, at that point. Oh, hus husband at the time. Okay, well, I thought, I think it was boyfriend at the time. But anyway, <laughs> uh, anyway whatever. They were, they were definitely colluding. And um, so, anyway, this patient came up by train with Walter, and the patient had Reese Buchler's dystrophy. And we, met, we, we hadn't hardly scanned rabbits and here we were scanning humans. And we got this tiny little segment of scan. And we were measuring more than one line, of course, assuming, therefore, that we're measuring subathelial scar. And we wrote a letter to the archives, um, which Walter Stark proceeded to reject repeatedly. And I remember this is my very first publishing experience, where, where I would go to Jack and I'd say, but now he's saying this. And at the end of the day, the last letter was, it, was a, it, it said, Dear Walter, it's just a letter, exclamation mark. You remember this? And it was accepted. So here you are, the very first publication of high-frequency ultrasound in the cornea. And it was followed by some of the work that I got on with, um, with uh, Ron, where we uh, created artificial uh, <coughs> trephinations in the cornea to create scarring reactions. And then we were applying Jack's tissue characterization techniques to see whether we could characterize wound healing within the cornea. And this was, it turns out you could, that you know you could get some color coding as to the um, amount of wound, as to the structure of the wound. And Norma published a paper on, um, which I don't think I have here, on the correlation between uh, this tissue characterization and backscatter and the amount of haze, which was the big topic in those days. <coughs> PRK, haze, was the big, haze was, haze was the big enemy. Um, a few years uh, around that time, also, we got a patient from, uh, from, uh, from Columbia, I believe. No, it was from Meath, actually. Uh, no, actually, it was from Joe DeLaRusso. He had treated one eye uh, of a patient, one PRK, and the other eye hadn't been treated yet. And so this gave us the opportunity to do some mathematics on the second surface, because here you had an eye that where Bowman's had been removed and the epithelium had just grown over it. But on this eye, Bowman's was still there. And we could assume that the eyes were similar because they were the same patient. And we calculated, based on a model that we wrote here, that we really were measuring the epithelium, which was hard to tell because no one comes down and says, this epithelium is 51 microns. And then you measure and say, oh, look, it's, it's correct. There was no way in vivo of you could take a histology slice, but by that time, you've distorted the tissue too much. So we, we actually calculated there was no way that we were not measuring the epithelium by acoustic impedance changes. Well, um, really, one of the first clinical steps that were, were taken was, and uh, you, some of you may remember, that in the early times in the second phase of the FDA trials, and Meath was part of this, uh, central islands were occurring at a rate, I can tell you this now, but at the time it was a bit of a secret, 50% of eyes had these things called central islands. They were, 
highly irregular central zones, which were causing double vision, and this would have definitely derailed the entire FDH trial if this hadn't been worked out. And Steve Trokel sent us uh, a series of patients through Meath, from Meath, and this map here, which was the first three-dimensional, one of the first three-dimensional maps of epithelial thickness, which eventually got published in ophthalmology in 94, uh, demonstrated the cause of the central islands. And, and if you see how this superimposes here, of course, it was a, just a three millimeter zone. But basically, we were able to show that over this peninsular ex extrusion here, there was epithelial thinning relative to the sides where it was thicker. And that was proving that the uh, central island was due to stromal bump with thinner epithelium over it, as opposed to epithelial heaping, which was another theory that the spiral epithelial healing was being heaped up. And it, anyway, big problem solved because um, what they did was, uh, uh, was they altered their ablation characteristics and just added extra pulses into the center. Uh, see, somebody p patented that, although they shouldn't have been able to. Um, but, uh, and that's why central islands went away with the broad area ablation uh, uh, lasers. Um, you've seen this slide. Um, several years later, when I finished my residency at Mount Sinai, I came back to Cornell, uh, and on a generous uh, $25,000 stipend, uh, uh, slept on the floor of the lab several nights. Um, cheaper than taking the subway home and back, that would have been $2.50 lost. And we, d we did a lot of work uh, on uh, basically building a mechano set here um, with the machine shop that was uh, at uh, Rockefeller. And we put the same transducer on, and we built from scratch, Ron and Tanya doing all of the electronics and, and programming here. And this li literally was the first scan. There's my iris. You see my lens surface and the two uh, bits of my iris there. Now, um, that particular machine did a huge amount of work. Uh, I took it to Vancouver, to my uh, refractive surgery and cornea fellowship, and um, Really, we started scanning LASIK at a time when the, 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 the general consensus was that LASIK was going to be better than PRK because you weren't going to get any epithelial changes in PRK, uh, in LASIK, as you did with PRK, because you lift the flap, you're not touching the epithelium, and you put it back, and so the epithelium is not going to change. So we're not going to get regression. That was the, uh, that was the podium speak at the time. And we were showing quite the opposite. We were also showing a lot of things about the stromal component of the flap, the flap thickness profile, and the bed. And I'm going to go through the next uh, 20 minutes or so to show you a lot of things that were coming out of just scanning and looking. So none of this real rocket science, just more uh, a sort of measure twice, cut once approach where you actually use diagnostic techniques to diagnose what's going on instead of just looking at topography and guessing what's going on beneath the surface. This is a rather seminal paper because it had a lot of the original information in it. And what we showed here was a, a full-length scan of the entire cornea horizontally. You could see the hinge of the nasal flap here. And you could see that we could isolate and measure between the indiv in individual interfaces. Here's the flap interface, front and back of the epithelium. We can measure the thickness of each of these layers with about one micron precision. And we could do it in 3D. And this meant that we could look at before and after scans and look at, I mean, study things like flap apposition. Here's Bowman's, you see, not quite reaching where it came from. And induced cylinder, because the flap was slightly retracted, we, were, we could look at micro irregularities in the bed of the flap and correlate those two optical defects post-op. And we were able to characterize just how accurate this was. And it turns out that we were able to localize each of the surfaces within the cornea with less than one micron precision. And uh, here's an M scan, for example, of one point on the cornea, 128 measurements. And there's our surface uh, localization uh, reproducibility. Here are 10 scans of show, uh, separate scans of the same eye, consecutive, showing the epithelial thickness in microns, there's 50 to 60, of the same eye. And you can see from one scan set to the, to the next, the pattern being very, very similar. And here's the mean thickness of all 10 measurements. And here's the standard deviation. And if you look here, the standard deviation of the 10 measurements of the same eye showed that most of the cornea was being mapped 
with a precision of under 1.2 microns in 3D, which means that the epithelial thickness profile changes that we may be observing could then be analyzed optically. And this was a big step. And here is a display that was published in that 2000 paper, which we, which we called the, the C12 display, cornea 12. And I'll be going through this map uh, uh, during the course of the lecture, showing you how the epithelial thickness before and after surgery changes in a difference map of the two, how the stromal thickness of the cornea alone before and after changes, the subtraction map between the two, the residual stromal thickness in three dimension under the flap, the actual flap post-op, the original flap created by the microkeratome, the stromal component of the flap. And these two maps here, the cornea pre and cornea post, are basically all the information that is currently available commercially and none other, even today, 20 years later. So until this is commercialized, these are still the only two thickness maps that are uh, in practice as we speak. The Artemis I, as Jack pointed out, was built um, uh, through a humongous engineering effort in Vancouver in 1999. Uh, this progressed to an Artemis II, which actually was slightly less good and didn't do very well, but uh, has led now to a company in Colorado called ArcScan uh, developing a, an Artemis III, which actually will be better than the Artemis I, and I've just seen a prototype uh, a couple of days ago at the ASTRS, and it is very interesting. The big, big, big breakthrough here, not just the ability to measure individual layers within the cornea, the big breakthrough is that we're able to simultaneously derive an optical positional uh, 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 map at the same time that we're doing the ultrasound scanning so that any changes that we observe in the layered pachymetry of the cornea can be correlated to the vision in an optical sense. And of course, this is true um, for anterior segment scanning as well. And, and you know, certainly in the U.S., um, uh, <coughs> refractive le uh, clear lens exchange is still is, is is still on the up in terms of popularity. It's dying off in Europe, but uh, multifocal lenses for people who don't have a cataract. Um, but and one of the one of the one of the reasons these things don't work that well is that if a patient has an angle kappa. Uh, there is a tilt to the anterior segment. These lenses are being put in the bag, which is symmetric to the anterior segment, not to the visual axis. Uh, and so you can end up in a situation where there is lens tilt and decentration, which causes coma and higher order aberrations and actually messes up the higher order aberrations for intra which were built into the lens to create multifocality. Now, just a couple of slides to show you the science that we, you know, we're behind what I'm about to, because I'm going to make a lot of claims here, uh, and uh, if I wasn't to prove to you that the machine was accurate enough to make those claims, uh, then you could, uh, you could just blow me off, but you won't be able to do that. Um, so what we've, uh, we've published now is the actual repeatability of this system, and you see that for epithelium, we're now able to measure central epithelium <coughs> with 0.58 uh, microns uh, of repeatability. Uh, if we're measuring the stromal thickness, which is, of course, a much thicker layer, that's 1.8 microns, the cornea 1.7, flap thickness 1.7, and the stromal bed 2.27. Why are these slightly less accurate? Uh, partially because they're, they're actually um, they're lar larger distances, but, but mostly because the interface isn't quite well defined at the stromal cut. Uh, you know, the, the lamellae are a little bit more disorganized, and where we're measuring at the echo is not always the same as a Bowman's interface, which is a specular uh, reflection. And we've uh, reviewed the literature as of last year, and there is no technology that has the same coefficient of variability uh, that VHF digital ultrasound has. Uh, so it's a 0.35% coefficient of variability, which, is, which beats any OCT system uh, at all. Um, the other thing, of course, is that um, although OCT systems have been used to measure the epithelium, um, the coefficient of variability is much, much higher. Uh, and, of course, none of these machines can currently measure in three dimensions. And if, and if they can, it'll only be in a four millimeter zone because they're doing rectilinear scanning. And to do telecentric scanning with an OCT is very, very difficult because the angular dependence is very, very high. Uh, unlike ultrasound, where you can vary your angular uh, approach to the cornea by 13 degrees in either direction, still get good signal. With optics, you cannot. You don't have that kind of variability. So the scanning arc from an OCT is going to have to vary 
per cornea. This is one of the drawbacks of OCT. Um, in terms of measuring flap, the only studies that are out there with OCT show also much less uh, accuracy in terms of flap thickness measurements, and of course can't be done in three dimensions. And um, in terms of features, and I, I mention this because I, I, some of you may hopefully review a paper of mine in the future, and, and we can stop this little cat and mouse thing where the optical people keep on rejecting the ultrasound papers because they don't understand them. Uh, the fact is that ultrasound will never be displaced by op optical systems for corneal thickness measurements. And that's because the nature of the cornea is transparency. That's why it works. And so it doesn't matter whether you do frequency domain or any other kind of manipulation of the optical data, you will never get the same interface detection as you will with ultrasound because ultrasound is looking at physical discontinuities within the cornea. And when you create a flap or you have a scar, you get physical discontinuities. And these are, ref well, reflective. They scatter ultrasound in a way that, well, if they scattered light, you couldn't see through your cornea. So does that make sense? So ultrasound is here to stay in the cornea as the way of measuring things most accurately. It's not going to go away. And the inconvenience of a water bath is you know, that's, that, that, that we can't get around. That's the laws of physics. Let me just show you some examples of what I'm talking about. So here's a very nice little thin flap created with a Visiomax laser at 80 microns, uh, say 50 microns beneath the surface of Bowman's. And here's a OCT from Zeiss, and here's an OCT from a better company showing that you can look at the epithelium, <laughs> but the flap interface is not quite visible, and that's even at four months. Here's another one, there's the other eye. By the way, the, the OptiView is, is this wide. And the, uh, of course, this is the way they display it, but it's only about that wide. And here's another example. Interface lights up like a Christmas tree, hardly visible on OCT. Same thing here at four months. Here's six months later, clearly visible. Six months, a year post-op, very difficult to see. One year, 18 months post-op, clear as a bell, almost impossible to find. 18 months post-op, 20 months post-op four years post-op, six years post-op. <coughs> anyway, point taken, yes? Now, well, let's go through some things that we've managed to learn by actually having the x-ray machine. If you imagine <laughs> orthopedic surgery before uh, Röntgen de described you know, x-ray, most orthopedic surgeons would have been saying, <clears throat> Yeah, well, I've never used that before, so why would I need it now? And Röntgen would have said, but look at my wife's hand. Uh, you can see the bones, and we look inside. And we're going to start with the epithelium. And as I showed earlier, um, here's an epithelial thickness pattern before, and this is after a myopic ablation. And this is a subtraction map between the two, an epithelial change map. And you see the epithelium thickened by 20 microns in the center here. But zero is where green starts. And so there's a negative change, meaning thinning of the epithelium in this region here. Why is the epithelium thinning when we ablate out of the center? We'll come back to that. First, we got to know what the normal thickness profile of the human cornea is. And unlike all of the textbooks that you can look in, saying that the epithelium is an even thickness layer of 50 microns throughout. This, these are 15, is that uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, so yeah, 15 randomly selected maps from 110 eyes that we scanned, and this is published, uh, where we show the epithelial <coughs> thickness pattern. Now, they are a little bit random. These are all in the same color scale for comparison. But if we average all of these, we average the right eyes together, and we average the left, we got a very distinct pattern. We found that the epithelium was um, thinner superiorly than inferiorly, and that if we were to reflect the left eyes so that we were looking at temporal and nasal uh, in both instances, um, we have, basically we can see that the morphology of the upper lid here rubbing cells off the superior cornea, and here you have the, the diagonal, the oblique line of the eyelid as it's coming down, creating this pattern of epithelial thickness. It just turns out that this is the reason why the eye works at all as a refractive system. Because if you think about it, 
you know, a one micron, a, a 12 micron change in thickness in the center of the cornea in a six millimeter zone equals a diopter of defocus. Why is it that you can buy a pair of glasses at nine o'clock on Monday, the 13th of April, and they still work at 5 p.m. on Friday on the 22nd of November? The curvature of the, ba of the front of the cornea has not changed, not by a micron. That's why your glasses still work every day. And how can a piece of biological tissue maintain this curvature to the micron day in and day out? And the answer is the tarsus. It's a semi-rigid membrane. It's blinking over the outside of the cornea, and it's, main, it's, it's giving a template upon, onto which the epithelium is growing. And it is providing the outer surface of the cornea with the, the shape that it needs to be. And that's a constant shape. It happens to be the wrong shape in some people, like some of you sitting here. But that is the shape that you have. We can fix that now, as you know. So let's see. Um, here's uh, the original paper that we had with our central islands. Here's that same Reese Buchler's dystrophy where we actually analyzed it in three dimensions. And here's uh, a study which published recently, although we, we did the work um, many years ago. It was presented at Arvo. Um, where we looked at the epithelial thickness profile before and after low, moderate, and high myopic ablation. And we found something rather curious. And this is the change in epithelium. So if you like this curve minus that curve, this is that curve. And we found that for low myopic patients, the change in epithelial thickness in the center was much greater than the periphery in lower myopes than it was for hyper, uh, high myopes. So the difference in change between center and periphery was less for high, high, high myopes, meaning the refractive shift produced by the epithelium was greater in low myopia than high myopia, although the epithelium was thickening more in high myopia. And this is a paradoxical finding, it turns out. We also were able to show that uh, as you saw earlier, that the epithelium thickens um, um, it, it, specifically where the tissue was removed from. And here's the um, average of the lo low, moderate, and uh, high myopic groups showing the change in epithelium and showing that although we used the same optical zone for tissue removal, the optical zone was effectively smaller as we went into the higher myopias. And the epithelial thinning in the periphery was more exaggerated as we got more and more deep into the cornea. We also studied, and we've published, the hyperopic epithelial changes. And this is fascinating because it has led to an understanding as to why hyperopic corneal surgery didn't work well in the past. And we've learned that the epithelium, as per the rule, thickens where the tissue is removed. Um, and so here's your donut-shaped ablation of the epithelium. We've, of course, we know that the epithelium will become thinner and thinner over the vertex of the cone the further we ablate. And we know that you can't steepen beyond a certain level or you'll fall off the hill. What we learned is that depending on how much you treat, of course, you get more thickening of the thickest point and more thinning of the thinnest point. But what was not obvious, and a new piece of information, was that if you plot the keratometry post-op with the epithelial thickness at the, central, at, the, at the thinnest point, you can have a flat cornea with very thin epithelium. You could think that it was safe to enhance this patient, but it would not be, because 26 microns is about the limit of thinning that the epithelium can tolerate, beyond which it breaks down. Likewise, you might have a very steep cornea at about 50, but the epithelium is still quite thick, and there is room for an enhancement. And so we've published a paper on hyperopic results from plus 4 to plus 7.5 using a 7 millimeter zone with same safety as you see for myopic treatments, no loss of two lines. Here's an example of how the epithelium is changing without tissue ablation. This is RK. There's no, there's some incisions made, the cornea changes shape, but no tissue was removed and yet you still get the same patterns. You get thickening in the center and thinning over the knee where the stromal surface has become projected forward. And here's a lot of other RKIs. Um, 
you can insert elements into the cornea and create stromal surface changes and observe epithelial changes. And in this paper, we demonstrated that it was actually the epithelial thickness shift that was the cause of the induction of cylinder caused by intracorneal ring segments. People were thinking that it was a mechanical effect because of two rings, but in fact, it was, it's an epithelial shift where the epithelium is flattening this axis more than this axis. Orthokeratology, another way of correcting myopia where you flatten something, it turns out to be the epithelium. Uh, and that is why orthokeratology requires nightly wear of these lenses because overnight the epithelium recovers and so does the myopic correction. And here in the other eye of this patient that we reported, um, the, the lens was decentered, and we got a decentered epithelial pattern as well, proving that it really was uh, the epithelium that was changing. And when we look at keratectasia, we find that the epithelium thins over the cone and becomes thicker around the periphery of the cone. And that's here's another, here are two other examples of ectasia. And this led us to take an interest in mapping keratoconus. And if you look at these uh, at keratoconic eyes with varying degrees of severity. Here's a mild keratoconic, moderate, severe, and very severe. And here are the topographies. You see that the cone produces this ever-increasing zone of thinning. And we thought, well, geez, that's interesting because that's a completely different pattern to that of the normal cornea. Can we exploit this for the early diagnosis of keratoconus? And we all know that um, this is a big issue because operating on an eye that's very mildly keratoconic, not sure, will probably cause a disaster called ectasia, or an acceleration of the ectatic process. Um, so what we're, what we're looking here for is the, is, is, is the, is the situation where um, the stroma has changed, but the epithelial surface has not. So the corneal topography has not shown much of a change, but the epithelial thickness profile has got slightly thinner because of the protrusion of the front surface of the cornea. The back surface, of course, is yoked to the front surface, and so it's moving forward. And many of, there's a big debate still on. I, mean, I was in a course just a few days ago uh, as to whether there was, the back surface was of any use in screening for keratoconus in, 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 in LASIK. And the answer is um, yes, but there are a lot of back surfaces that are wonky where the cornea is not keratoconic. And so we've got examples here of um, lots of completely normal looking topographies analyze this normal by the topographer where, in fact, we had this keratoconic pattern under the surface showing that there was a subsurface cone, and quite similar to the keratoconic. And likewise, we have a lot of examples, false positives, if you like, where the topography looks not sure. The machine is saying this is a suspect keratoconus, and no matter how normal this looks to you, you'd have to have extremely big ones to try and operate on a patient like this with that on the record. <coughs> if, however, you, you had, sorry. That last, when did you have that? Time? I just, uh, you know, just, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. You, you, these are entirely normal epithelial thickness profiles. And you'd say, well, you'd still have to be pretty brave to operate on a patient with this in the medical record. And let me tell you, we were. Because form thrust is not a diagnosis, it's just an observation. It means it looks like keratoconus. And it just means that the phenotype hasn't expressed itself enough to us to call it keratoconus, and that's why we're equivocating. What we really need is a diagnostic technique that differentiates a topography, which is not, not clear, into either keratoconic or not, so that we can definitively say no surgery or yes surgery. And we did just that. Here's a series of 1,500 eyes screened by the conventional methods using a back surface and finding 9%, most of us find about 10% of our patients unsuitable due to topo topographic irregularity. We scanned these with epithelial thickness profiles, differentiated them, and went and did LASIK on the patients who we convinced ourselves did not have keratoconus. And this is published in the Journal of Refractive Surgery. We had a matched control group with matched by spherical equivalent cylinder IOP and age. And we found that at one year, the stability of the spherical equivalent was identical for the control group and the suspect group. Uh, as you can see here, no, no statistically significant difference at each time point, no difference in safety. Uh, and the vector analysis uh, for each group between time points, between groups, 
and between the change in vector for a cylinder, no difference. Therefore, uh, basically concluding that we can use epithelial thickness profiles to exclude keratoconus where the topography might imply it and safely do LASIK without having to resort to doing PRK and th crossing our fingers and hoping that it wasn't keratoconus. So you've seen here that the epithelium changes no matter what you do to the stromal surface. It doesn't matter if you do it by tissue removal, by insertion of an object, by bending it, by weakening it through an incision. No matter what you do to the cornea, the epithelium will change. And that is because of the relationship between the, the, stro the, the, the outlet, the, uh, the, uh, the upper lid, uh, shape of the upper lid, and uh, the stromal surface. Unfortunately, you can have the same outer surface but different stromal surfaces. And this is why we led to coin this kind of rule. First of all, that if you see irregular astigmatism, there will be irregular epithelium. That's a rule. And the phrase would be that if an eye presents with irregular topography, by definition, the epithelium has reached its maximum compensatory function. And what that means is that any topographic me measurement of an irregular cornea, or any wavefront measurement for that matter, is going to be inaccurate in terms of being able to describe the shape of the stromal surface, which is the problem surface. The epithelium just tries to even things out. So for the correction of complications of corneal refractive surgery, I'm sorry to tell you that what we've been doing industrially for the last 10 years, which is relying on these wavefront measurements, we're talking about wavefront measurements, are, it turns out that's not going to be the end, the end game. We're going to need true diagnosis. And here's an example of a decentered, uh, what looks like a decentered ablation, but in fact, it was a short nasal flap with ablation of a minus eight. And here you see the short flap. You see the ablation was done, so there's a step down here. Uh, no ablation because the flap couldn't be reflected fully nasally. And you see the epithelium is thickened tremendously just on the inside of the hinge, producing a tent effect, which causes big flattening, which makes the topography look flatter. And of course, a topography guided treatment would go and take tissue all the way out from here to try and straighten this to the patient's vision out, wrong place. The, the, we, we know from, the, from knowing what caused this that the tissue needs to be removed from this side, totally the other side of the cornea. And so a diagnosis from the anatomy of the cornea tells you exactly what needs to be done to fix the eye, not some kind of you know, analysis of, 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 you know, you hardly could tell that I look the way that picture is because I've got my clothes on from the previous photo. Right? So anyhow, in 2000, I sent this epithelial thickness profile to Gerhard Yusefi at Bausch and Lohm, and he programmed a topography-guided ablation, but corrected it for the epithelial thickness difference. And this was highly, highly off-label, but we did it. And this was in Vancouver. And here's the pre-op topography, and here's the one-day post-op. You see absolutely, I mean, an extraordinary repair. Um, I made another flap beneath the other one. That's a whole other story. But you can see the stromal surface, this bump here, regularized by taking the right information. Another example of what looks like a decentration, but actually was only due to flap malpositions, highly irregular Bowman surface. And once this flap was repositioned, the topography regularized totally. You didn't have to do a wavefront guided or a topography guided treatment to repair that. Now. Again, epithelial thickness profiles are the mask of the complication in the cornea. And here's an example which we published uh, in the JCRS of a, a NASA engineer who had had multiple uh, procedures performed on his uh, left eye. And as you see, uh, there were obviously been these all lamellar procedures, a, a second cut and a lift of the original cut. So he basically had lots of layers and a somewhat irregular topography fairly normal looking orbs, orb scan, and aberrations that were what you'd expect for someone of this refraction. But very low contrast and uh, absolute incompatibility. He used to walk around with a patch on one eye because of the, 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 the discomfort of the different vision. So here's his topography. 
Here's the cross, here's his wave front. Here's the cross section of his cornea before we started. You see Bowman's is highly irregular here. And his epithelial thickness profile is, you see, thin, thick, thin, thick rings. It looks exactly like an array lens. And actually, just like an array lens, it was causing really uncomfortable vision with low contrast. And when we did a transepithelial PTK, which of course would hit the stroma where the epithelium is thinnest first and ablate through until the bottom of the epithelium, we found that we were able to totally smooth the stromal surface, regularize the epithelial thickness, of course, because that just flows over the smooth surface, and we were able to increase his contrast from low to high normal. Here's a stop photography um, uh, intraoperatively showing you after 55 microns of ablation, here's the, what we predicted we'd see, and that's exactly what we saw. There's a bit of epithelium left over here in a ring, et cetera, et cetera. Now, here's another example of how the epithelium masks uh, current technology from being able to repair eyes. And a patient who had RK from minus six and some trapezoidal incisions added in, and, well, many years later, he's plus 650 minus 8 with a best corrected vision of 2050. His epithelium looked like this, and his topography looked like that. So relatively normal topography, you'd say, with a lot of cylinder, and you could go and do that, or you could model what the epithelial, transepithelial thickness um, uh, ablation would have uh, produced, and we did that, and we treated this patient first by transepithelial PTK because of this analysis. And as you see, here's the intraop photo stopping at the right point just to check that our epithelial ablation rate is correct. And here is the model of the stroma that would have been removed during that transepithelial PTK, knowing the thickness profile of the epithelium. And of course, it's a hyperopic astigmatic shape ablation. And if you look here before and after this PTK, we halved the cylinder um, just by transepithelial PTK. This is the difference map. We did not treat cylinder. We just did a transepithelial PTK using the epithelium as a mask. And you can see the pre-op epithelium here, the post-op epithelium, highly regular, and now a candidate for topography-guided treatment because the epithelium is no longer throwing off the asymmetry of the stromal surface. And here's the change map of the epithelium, and here's what we predicted was going to happen. Here's what happens if you steepen a cornea too much. Here's a Vizix plus six uh, done in what's called a six millimeter zone. It ends up being, of course, much smaller, five by five. And we have this apical syndrome, the central scarring, due to the fact that the rate of change of, uh, the rate of, change of curvature towards this new vertex is so high that the epithelium just can't climb up there. And it's not about the caves. It's about the rate of change of curvature. And using a diagnostic technique, we were able to uh, measure the scar. And using a transepithelial planned approach, we were able to remove the scar and regularize this patient's cornea. You can see here pre- and post-op uh, scans. And then proceed with a hyperopic ablation in a large zone, modern ablation zone. Let's just move down a little bit down to the stroma. We have here a pre-op stroma and a post-op stroma. And remember, we talked about how the epithelium was thinning in the periphery. Well, it turns out that although we remove tissue from the center, here we go, 0 to minus 20, we thicken the stroma in the periphery. So the epithelium is reacting to stromal thickening in the periphery. It is compensatory thinning. And if we look at the normal thickness profile progression of the human cornea, we found another thing which was previously not known. And that was that if you divide a population of 110 eyes into thick corneas, thin corneas, and average corneas, and you set the thinnest point of the stroma to zero and plot as you go out towards the periphery the absolute increase in thickness it turns out that the absolute rate of thickening is the same whether you start with a thin cornea or whether you start with a thick cornea. So your cornea will thicken by 80 microns out to the 3.5 millimeter zone whether you start at 490 or whether you start at 590. 
And this is a massive surprise. You know that the pentacam has a big, you know, famous plot, which is the percentage thickness increase as a diagnostic tool for keratoconus. And of course, you can all work out immediately, I can see you all doing that, that the percentage increase starting at a thinner cornea is going to be a lot greater than a thicker cornea. And so you're not going to be able to diagnose keratoconias in thicker corneas, which exists. Um, we were able to prove that the ablation depth of a, of a particular laser, the Melady in this case, was the display was measuring 20 microns too much. And in fact, if you, you may not know this, but none of the manufacturers have those displays, that number of microns that it's telling you it's taking, it's all random. It's all people in a lab doing physics saying, well, we think that's the number of microns. But here we've actually measured the change in stroma from pre to post. And you see, you cannot do that by a pre and post corneal thickness measurement because the epithelium changes randomly. And so your so-called ablation depth by corneal thickness subtraction is going to be off by how many microns the epithelium changed. Um, topography guided treatment um, is, as I've said, something that works relatively well if the corneas are relatively regular. Um, and here's an example of an irregularly irregular cornea where we have a pre and post stromal change map by Artemis. And here's the predicted change by the laser itself. Just to go back now to the stromal thickening in the periphery, why is this occurring? Well, this is occurring due to a mechanical changes within the cornea. And it turns out that as you cut peripheral fibers when you make this flap, so these anterior stroma rarefies, it, it relaxes. And so there's a vector, uh, and the cross-linking between lamellar planes causes a pull and part of that vector causes flattening of the center of the cornea. And we see that here in multiple examples of this peripheral thickening. Over the last 10 years, the generally accepted dogma about why we induce spherical aberration, mostly, um, I mean, uh, Morochen and Zeiler published this, that there is degradation of the amount of ablation that we're getting towards the periphery because the beam is reflected or um, or, or, or there's a, there are reflection losses or projection losses. So the fluence is lower. And so it turns out that actually that's only 15% of the effect. The mechanical changes within the cornea are actually what's causing the vast majority of the degradation of the myopic profile. And it's 85% of the effect. Now, so what's going on in a cornea when you do a myopic ablation is very complicated. Not only are you getting your tissue removal, but you're also getting central flattening, and you're getting front surface curvature increase due to epithelial thickening, and you're getting thinning in the periphery, and you're getting tissue expansion, which is decreasing your optical zone. There's a lot going on. And this is partially why wavefront guided treatments don't work that well for the correction of night vision disturbances. The story goes like this. Here is a minus 10 patient with a Munnerlin equation ablation straightforward, did lots of them, you in, and what happens is you induce a ton of spherical aberration. And here's an example of an epithelial thickness profile showing, well, the, thick, the thickening in the center in a very small zone. And here we have the modern version of new laser with many, uh, Visix calls it wavefront guided, uh, the other companies called it call it wavefront optimized, but basically what they've done is taken the spherical aberration profile, reversed it, how much was induced, put it into the profile, and hoped that we, you would prevent the induction. <coughs> well, it did somewhat, but you can see this characteristic epithelial thickness profile where it's thicker like a donut and thinner because of the spherical aberration that's popped in to the ablation profile. It turns out that that only works at an efficiency of about 27%. So you can put in the spherical aberration that you would have induced, and you'll only reduce the induction by 27%. Well, we said, well, why don't we boost this? And instead of, if you're going to induce one micron, let's put in two and see how much we induce. It turns out that that does induce less, but because of the shape of spherical aberration, you start to induce 
Central Islands all over again with a flying spot laser. So that's not a working, uh, working uh, option. What we did was to start adding peripheral tissue directly. And what this led to was far less induction of spherical aberration, no central islands, and true optical zones without inducing spherical aberration. So is this a free lunch? Well, in a way it is, because the Munnerlin equation shows the ablation depth according to how much you're treating. The wavefront optimized are slightly aspheric, and of course they take more tissue. The more aspheric you make the profile, the more uh, tissue you need. The theoretical equation for the boosting that we did would have meant masses of tissue removal to prevent a, a, the induction of spherical aberration. But what we found with various iterations of taking more and more peripheral tissue was that the central flattening that we could get mechanically started to help us correct myopia. And so the efficiency of these profiles becomes higher the more and more peripheral tissue you remove. And so there is a free lunch. We're able to now, for example, correct a minus 11 in a 500 micron cornea with a micro thin flap and still leave 300 microns in the bed, which is 50 more than would have been OK, without a small optical zone and without inducing night vision disturbances. If you can measure op items within the stroma, you can also make diagnoses as to regression. You see, here's a patient of mine who had PRK for minus 950. She was minus 0.6 at three months and disappeared to law school. She came back two years later minus three with Hayes. And this is her scan two weeks ago. And you can see here a subepithelial deposition of new stromal tissue. The actual change in the stromal thickness be from before and to now was 87 microns. We had planned uh, 125. So we only, the stromal only was different by 70% of this, which is a 30% undercorrection by stromal tissue difference. And that is exactly how much undercorrection she had. So we could now diagnose the cause of her regression. It's not ectasia. It is stromal deposition and confidently go and remove more tissue from her. Here is the before, haze, and after. Uh, the original flap thickness is another thing. You know that, of course, um, the flap is created before the epithelium changes. And so if you just measure the flap afterwards, as many OCT scientists have been doing on intralays flaps to see how accurate the intralays is, you can't do that because the epithelium has changed. The only way to know what the femtosecond laser did is to take the stromal component of the flap when the edema has subsided, add it to the pre-op epithelium, and determine what exactly happened at the time of flap creation. And we've done this and published um, reproducibility for the Visumax. And uh, there's a couple of slides that I'll skip on measurement precision. Many of these instruments that have 10 micron precision are being used to say that the intralase flaps have 5 micron uh, reproducibility. And of course, if you have two flaps, one that's 105 and one that's 115, and you've got a machine that can measure with a very tight precision and one that has a very wide precision, you could have two flaps that are actually the same, uh, 10 microns apart, but look the same depending on what machine you're using to measure it. So there's a lot of misrepresentation of, uh, of uh, flap thickness reproducibility out there at the moment. It also means that by knowing how precise your femtosecond laser is, you can avoid what's called, today it's called, gas breakthrough. And what it really is is a buttonhole when the, the, the actual laser is coming out of the stroma into the epithelium. If you know what these tolerance levels are, you can make sure that you program your flaps to never go into the epithelium. Uh, let me go a little bit further <coughs> onto ectasia, because normally we would just jump in and, and enhance a patient, not knowing where the ground was. And here is a case of mine, a minus six, and predicted was 280 in each eye, and the right eye, uh, 278 predicted, the residual stromal thickness was 277, no problem. The left eye predicted 281, but it turned out that the residual was 218. And had I enhanced her, I would have left her with less than 200, and she would have developed ectasia. <coughs> but we didn't enhance her. 
So knowing where the ground is actually helps in enhancement. That's something which if I'd given this lecture seven years ago, it would have been brand new information. Now I think people are starting to recognize that ectasia, uh, due to excessive amounts of tissue removal from the bed, is uh, relatively avoidable. We modeled ectasia. We modeled what the ectasia rate would be depending on the imprecisions of the microkeratome flap thickness and um, corneal thickness measurements and found that certain microkeratomes were one million times more likely to produce ectasia than others. And yet, they're marketed in the same way and approved by the FDA in the same way. Um, let me just skip over this, which is um, a paper which we'll be presenting at the Academy showing the relative imprecision of um, handheld bed measurements uh, intraoperatively. Uh, I'll show you um, to finish, because I've run a little bit over, and I'm sure you're, I'm sure you're riveted, but you do have other things to do. Um, I'm just going to show you a little bit beyond the cornea uh, and, and into the anterior segment, because this machine, from a refractive surgical standpoint, has serious implications for fake and trocular lens surgery, and in particular, um, the, the sizing of these eye wells, which produces the vast majority of the complications of this surgery, um, as well as, of course, the long-term monitoring. And you all know that uh, if you're able to determine where an eye well is going to end up, this was actually the very first poster that uh, Jack present, I helped work on. It was Jack's poster at the Academy in 1991 when I arrived here, um, showing that if you knew the ELP, you could improve the prediction of IOLs. I remember, Mark, you were modeling that. Uh, you could do it to the quarter diopter. And uh, even today, there's, I think there's just now a lens that's just come out, quarter diopter steps. Um, and the Artemis III now is able to measure the whole lens volume. And theoretically, potentially, that could help with the mechanics of accommodative IOLs, uh, as well as predicting ELP position. But um, the, the, the lateral precision of uh, Artemis technology we've, we've, we've published and is, is extremely high, uh, is somewhere in the order of 10 to 30 microns lateral uh, accuracy. So when we use this to measure dimensions within the eye to determine the size of phacic eye wells, we can actually avoid practically all of these uh, medium and long-term complications of phacic eye wells. We've just recently dispelled the latest commercial attempt to say that you don't have to measure sulcus to sulcus to put in an ICL. And that was uh, purported by those who could measure with an OCT the angle to angle distance and saying that the angle to angle tells you what the sulcus to sulcus is going to be. Well, right here is an example of how you've got an eye where the sulcus equals the angle. Here's one where the sulcus is larger than the angle. And here's one where the sulcus is smaller than the angle. And as it turns out, we can measure the sulcus uh, with 0.22 millimeter reproducibility and the angle with 0.12. And we published a study in which we demonstrated just how wrong you can go if you don't make measurements directly when you're putting an IOL into the eye, of a, into a fake eye. If you're trying to predict angle diameter from the white to white alone, the probability that you're going to put in a lens that's one size wrong, like half, because these come in half sizes, half millimeter sizes, is 6%. If you apply a multivariate regression model to age, sphere, cylinder, spherical equivalent, white to white, ACD, SIMKs, corneal thickness and angle diameter, and white to white, right? The only surviving terms are white to white, corneal thickness and mimic keratometry, but you're still going to have 3% of the time a lens that is one size off. If you were to measure this angle to angle directly with 0.12 precision, you would reduce that error rate to 0.01%, 1 in 10,000. So effectively making anterior chamber lenses bulletproof. If you are thinking about putting an ICL into someone's eye and you were using the white to white uh, suggested formulas by the company, the chances that you're going to have an error of 0.5 millimeters, one size off, 
is 38%. If you use this new with a 25% error, the rate of anterior subcapsular cataract formation for ICLs over a period of 10 years is only about 6%. So there's some huge area to play with in there. There's a lot of safety margins. So if we were to be able to reduce that down to 3% in terms of volt height control, we could probably get the anterior subcapsular rate down to zero. And Carlo Lovizolo lent me this slide because there are a lot of um, lower frequency machines that are used, and he did a study comparing all of these. He doesn't have financial interest in any of these, but he found, of course, as expected, that uh, high-frequency ultrasound with digital signal processing gives you the best precision for sulcus measurements. Here's an example of a toric ICL that came in um, decentering, decentering, it was recentered several times, and it kept on decentering, and the patient was sent to us, and we found that the patient had what I call sulcus recession. <laughs> Essentially, a very odd-shaped sulcus, and therefore the sizing of this lens was totally off, according to the white-to-white -white equations. And uh, that explained why. So, you know, in summary, the ability to uh, make direct measurements of the layers that we're trying to alter as surgeons, as engineers of the, of the eye, uh, the ability to make these measurements means that we can convert <clears throat> refractive surgery, which, you know, has hitherto been somewhat of a kind of voodoo practice uh, speciality, uh, into a true engineering speciality. Uh, and maybe we can get a little respect from the uh, people who are uh, scientific at the back of the eye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Dan, thank you. That was spectacular. I couldn't help but thinking uh, just one thing before I ask for questions. You know, many of us wonder why you stay in academic uh, uh, pursuits. And I think as we go get older, like Harvey and I, or at least me, uh, we remember some patients that we've saved, but to think back and have a, a colleague, a student that worked with you that has risen to the very peak of eminence that, uh, that Dan has is probably the most uh, great gratifying thing that we can have as, uh, as academic ophthalmologists or anything. And I know, Ron, you feel uh, the same way. Um, one, one other quick little thing, and that is the very beginning I showed the Dyson Institute where uh, Dan and Ron and all of us uh, had extra time to do things. Uh, just a week ago, I think, uh, Mark Rosenblatt was appointed as new director of the Dyson. So, Mark, we wish you well. And remember what I'm saying about uh, helping the colleagues. So bring your pride to them later. Any questions for Dan? But the, the, the normative data for, for, for your measurements of, of corneal uh, epithelial thickness, uh, um, is it, is it, does it vary by, by K readings? Or do you find it's fairly uniform? Uh, it did not vary by K readings, actually. Um, the, um, in other words, you could have a flat cornea with a superior to inferior difference in thickness, and you could have a steep cornea with the same difference. There, um, there, there wasn't a trend with Ks. Yeah, yeah. Same question, but for rate of change of scrotal <clears throat> thickness, vis a vis, uh, had you plotted it uh, as opposed to just distance from the apex of the, the cornea uh, with respect to different apical curvatures of the cornea to see if those curves were so superimposable? Yes, and there was no correlation between uh, thickness progression, or at least there certainly there was no. Pro there was no. First of all, there was no correlation between stromal thickness and K's. In other words, it wasn't like thinner corneas were steeper, because they'd be thinner because they'd be bulging more. No, uh, and the thickness progression was purely dependent on. It was just a. It was just a. a, a physical progression of 80 microns from the thinnest point uh, to the three-point film. It's absolutely uh, astounding that a biological system would have something so orthogonal uh, built into it. Yeah. Good. Is your assumption that the, uh, the tarsus is actually rubbing off the superior epithelium and that's why it's thinner 
you're saying that that provides the template for the cornea. So is that your assumption? It's literally rubbing off the epithelial cells and making it thinner superiorly? Or is it just a pressure thing? Well, it's probably both, um, uh, of course. But if you think about it, we, we have our eyes open during the day, um, most of us. Uh, I know that my talk wasn't that interesting for parts, and I noticed that. Too. But um, but uh, the it's a combination of chafing, but it's because the, sh the cells aren't dry; they're mm -hmm. lying underneath mucin, and, and uh, but there's a there's a sort of um, increased friction, and there's also the ortho K effect, which is that there, there's a cumul. If you think about every blink as a tap, uh, there's a sort of cumulative force uh, applied to that. Uh, one of the ways that you could even imagine for yourselves why this is true, uh, is that what happens to astigmatism with age. So we have, with the rule, astigmatism when we're younger, and our eyelids are quite tightly opposed to the globe. And as the uh, tarsus uh, you know, and, and, and the canthus becomes more and more lax, so the force of the eyelid onto the cornea mm -hmm. diminishes, and so that reduces the amount of, of, of cylindrical, uh, in this direction, force onto the cornea. And so the astigmatism goes against the rule. And it's an epithelial shift. The clinical paradigm would be the shield ulcer in GPC. Exactly. Where you're, where you're getting uh, a non-infiltrative ulcer <clears throat> secondary to the rubbing. And the delin, where you have a divot and so the epithelium is drying, and so therefore it's not filling in, and so there's a gap between the rigid tarsus. So the tarsus is not filling the divot. But that's, a, that's a little different mechanism because it's almost like the windshield wiper with the bug on the windshield. Right. The tarsus is jumping over right. the cornea Right, and, and lead, leading to, you're still teaching me, you're still teaching me. <laughs> You used to call it a squeegee. You don't do that yeah, anymore. Precisely. A squeegee? Yeah. Order Francis called a rock <laughs> Very good, very good. Oh, actually, in keratoconus, we get uh, epithelial breakdown over the cone after a certain time. And that's because the rate of change of curvature is now just too much for the epithelium to climb over and stay on the top of the hill. Mm. Dan, you have kept uh, even retina people uh, fascinated uh, uh, for absolutely delightful talk. Clearly, you're the master, and uh, we're proud of you, and thank you for coming to speak to us. Thank you. Take these back to uh, yes, of course. first line.